Hey friends, Dylan McManus with Henry Cal Redwood State Park here. In this video, we're gonna hear from one of the park's environmental scientists, Portia Halbert, who's going to be speaking to us about a rare and sensitive beetle species that lives in the Santa Cruz Sandhills, the Mount Hermon June beetle. Made it. All across the Northern Hemisphere, on this place we call planet Earth, starting every spring as early as the end of April and peaking in June, there's this emergence of beetles. They come right up out of the ground. And I'm specifically talking about scarab beetles. And there are 30,000 scarab beetles worldwide. And the diversity of this group is pretty amazing. And there's a well-known quote from a uh, a British evolutionary biologist who says, uh, sorry, his name was J.B.S. Haldane, and he quipped that if a god or divine being had created all living organisms on earth, then the creator must have been, must have an inordinate fondness for beetles. Beetles account for a greater number of species than any other single group of living animals approximately one out of every four animals on this planet is a beetle. I just love that, that concept. And let's see, going to next. And many of you are, are probably familiar with the concept of a scarab that represented resurrection in ancient Egypt. Their image was found in hieroglyphs and it was used in art. Because of the dung beetle significance in ancient Egypt, it was associated with the, the sun god who drove the sun across the sky every day. The scarab beetle came to represent the eternal cycle of life, and that round ball of dung uh, became a symbol of birth, life, death, and resurrection. Just love that a dung beetle can mean that to a, a culture. And here we have uh, an image of our, our June beetle here. This is uh, our local one. And again, it's named after the time of year that they emerge, usually between May and June. So there are sometimes called May beetles. Uh, and I've heard of them called watermelon beetles, but I've never met anyone who calls them that. And they're members of the polyphyla family. They, they have this hard outer covering. Let's see if my cursor works. You guys can maybe see that. This hard outer covering that's called an elytra. And it is um, it covering their actual wings. You can see that once they land, the wings fold underneath that hard outer covering. And in order to take off, they lift that elytra and uh, are able to move here. But it's depicted really nicely in this photo. There are more than 800 species of June bugs uh, known and more are found all the time. Adult beetles are generally blackish or brown in color and they tend to be kind of hairy on their fronts and you can make out some of that hair here. They are active in the evening and early night and they're big enough to be easily noticed but between about one and three centimeters. So just, just over an inch long or so. And the life cycle takes one to three years to complete. Let's look at that a little bit more closely. Now, the June bug starts off obviously as an adult and it lays uh, pearl shaped eggs that are oval, they're dull colored uh, and like slightly off white and creamy. And they're about a 16th of an inch long and they lay those underground and each egg hatches into this C-shaped larvae. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of curled up like so. And they're commonly known as a white grub. The grub is also considered a larva. And the immature form of this kind of insect is also called an instar. They develop hardened exoskeletons. And as they mature each time, each one of these is known as a separate instar. And finally, they metamorphose into this pupa. And then the pupa is in the ground for about a short period of time. And then it, again, uh, changes into this adult form. Uh, let's, let's go in a little bit more onto that. I think I, I like this because it, it shows the life cycle throughout the years. 
And here again, we have the adult form that shows up here uh, in the late spring and summer. And the whole point is reproduction. The, the uh, adults emerge, they reproduce, the eggs are laid, and then about three weeks into that, uh, it takes for the, the eggs to hatch into the larvae. And uh, these white grubs or instars, they feed on the roots of plants, disrupting the uptake uh, of waters and sugars by the plant. And in the East and Midwest, they are considered a pretty noxious pest and uh, they can be a serious threat to lawns and different landscaping. There's, if you, if you look into it, there's all sorts of control methods that uh, I didn't dig into, but if a, a lot of people are interested in how to get rid of them. The larvae can really decimate lawns by eating, uh, eating the roots. Now that grub can grow to be about two inches long with three pairs of legs, and it's got this white body and brown head. I think my next slide has a, a, a better view of that. This image gives you a good idea of what they look like in person, right? Front and center, right? And in terms of feeding here, notice the little guy on the right has actually got a piece of plant matter in his hands and he's feasting on it. You can see that he's chewing on it. Now, they, um, in terms of feeding, it's, not that it's not necessarily uh, assumed that they're feeding on one particular species. There was, you know, a time most endangered species, uh, let's just say, they can't really be protected in a way that is thorough until you know what they eat. And there was anecdotal information that they were specific in terms of what they liked to eat. It was said that they liked to eat the Bonnie Doom manzanita or, or local rare manzanita. And it turns out that there was a paper that came out, the Hill and O'Malley paper titled A Picky Palette, the host plant selection of an endangered June beetle. And it turns out that it's uh, not true that they just eat one species. They like angiosperms. What are angiosperms? They're just flowering plants. They also like uh, the things like ferns and funguses. And it, this was all discovered by examining the contents of the frass pellets. So basically, some scientists did some close evaluation of the poop of these little instars and determined that they're feeding primarily on the, the roots of, of many, many different species of plants. These are the two kinds of beetles we have here. And there is even another subspecies of this one here on the left, the 10 line June beetle. And I'll get to a little bit more of that in a second. But here they are as adults. And you can see that the, the 10 lined beetle, as it's known, you can uh, note those uh, lines that they have on them. Uh, the, Adults do not eat. They instead, they emerge from the sandy soil solely to mate. The whole point is reproduction, as I mentioned. The females are flightless and males can be observed flying around searching for mates at this twilight time period during the summer. And at the end of the flight period, each evening males burrow back underground, emerging repeatedly on subsequent nights until all of their energy reserves are gone and then they, they also die. Females are believed to lay eggs at the bottom of their burrows. They also have these burrows that they, they return to, and then they die a short time later. The life cycle continues as newly hatched larvae tunnel and look for more roots. And here we can see the, the size comparison. So the, the last photo was you know front and center, direct comparison. Now, uh, here we have them in real life right in front of you. And you'll notice the, the immediately there's a size difference. It's about two thirds the size, the Mount Hermon June Beetle to the 10 line June Beetle. It looks like a petite version. Uh, the Mount Hermon June Beetles are about two centimeters long. Again, they're the ones here on the, on the right of my screen. There is a continuous line on the 10 line beetles. 
and it's not always quite 10 lines. I can count four, five, six, seven, eight, nine lines, or those shorter ones. And some of them have a, a few more and a few less. I actually have uh, one that I was hoping to pass around the room. Some people who live in this area will often find them. Ooh, the light is a little. Can you guys make that out? You can see here uh, in person, this one actually has uh, 10 lines. Mostly I want to make sure you can look at those and say which one is which. And the 10 line June beetle is the one that has these very distinct lines. And our Mount Hermon June beetle, our endangered species, uh, it has these uh, broken or discontinuous lines on it. And I also want to maybe put a plug in for another really cool beetle that we have in the sand hills. It's called the rain beetle. It's a small brown beetle that only emerges right after the very first rains of the year. And I happen to also live in the sand hills and uh, I will often see it in, in those first two, maybe three rains of the season, just to kind of an uh, inconspicuous smallish brown beetle that, that comes up out of the ground to do its business during this uh, short period of time. Okay, now I mentioned that we have two different kinds of 10 line beetles and they look exactly the same. Like there's not really much you'd be able to look at them very easily and tell the difference, right? They do look exactly the same essentially on the outside, but down below the waist, they are really quite different. This slide shows you several different types of uh, polyphaga, different June beetles. And uh, you can see the top shows you that they all look essentially the same. And the bottom is the male genitalia. And you can, uh, you can see these external similarities on the, the beetles and then this internal dissimilarities. Uh, they're, they're very much like a, a lock and a key, right? And so this is, the, this is how they, there, are no, there is no interbreeding between these different species. So entomologists would know the difference only by carefully examining the genitalia. Pretty trippy. Now, beetles uh, exhibit something we call sexual dimorphism as well. That means, oh, pardon me, that the, uh, the different genders, uh, males and females, they look different, right? Males will have large eyes and they have these antennae that, they, uh, that help them seek out females to mate with, right? These, uh, this top portion is called a club uh, and they're, they have a slightly larger one that allows them to pick up the, those or smell the pheromones the females are putting off. And here I have a, another video, but I think I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna skip it just because of the technical difficulties and tell you about the timing of beetle activity. Mount Hermon June beetles, they emerge between 8 p.m. and 10 p.m. And they're pretty spot on in terms of that time period. It's just after sunset in the summertime period while the air above the ground is still pretty warm. Male flight activity can be limited by temperature. If it's too cold, if it's too windy, they won't be very active. Also by dense cloud cover, apparently. Uh, their wings make a distinctive crackling sound as they fly up through the vegetation, and they're often found flying low to the ground, seeking the source of those pheromones. And they, the males will, once they've found a female, they will often swarm on her. And uh, once a female is located, several males often compete. So there will often be sort of like a, a mating ball, one female will be surrounded by and there'll be uh, males kind of crawling all over her. And a successful male will copulate for two to 10 minutes. And during that time period, the female might actually be actively burrowing down to uh, begin laying her eggs. Pretty trippy. Now the Santa Cruz mountains are largely volcanic in origin. There's uh, these scattered patches of soil from sedimentary sources. And that's where we have our sandstones. And uh, the, these patches in particular are known as the Zioni Sand Hills, and they're indicated by the green splotches there. 
And most of you are familiar with the sand hills that we have here in the park. They're uh, surrounding the, the campground up by the observation deck and in what we call the new acquisition uh, off of Graham Hill Road uh, adjacent to Mount Hermon. Now the sandy habitat provides a different micro microclimate. It's, uh, it dra the soil drains better and they're somewhat drier, generally warmer, more exposed. They've got chaparral vegetation on them. And due to its limited geographic range, a lot of species uh, that live there are, are specialized. And unfortunately, a large portion of the sand hills have been lost, I believe something, oh, do I have a number here? I think that it's estimated that about 60% of the sand hills have been disturbed in some way, uh, largely through direct habitat loss or development, but also from the, the historic sand quarries that have been found in the area. Now, I wonder, uh, I'm gonna uh, talk, get into our, our beetle trapping now. And uh, during our trapping last year, the practice is to set the traps up and wait as the observer. I am just looking to see what I can observe to be present in my surroundings. And last year, as I was sitting in the sand near my trap, I'm watching these woodpeckers go into and out of a snag hole. And uh, the light is, is fading and I see a, a woodpecker land on one of the branches. And I notice that he's got something big, fat and round in his mouth. And I realized that could only be a June beetle. And somehow I hadn't really made that mental connection that there's other animals out there eating the June bugs. And it turns out that they do of course play an important role in helping with nutrient cycling. Uh, they munch on roots, they concentrate nutrients into juicy or you know, the, the larvae would be a little juicy snack and the adult would be a little crunchy snack. And here we have an image of a bluebird. It's an Eastern bluebird, but uh, consuming one of these. And uh, of course that process would also be happening with the Mount Hermon June beetles we have here. I discovered that they are a rich source of protein. They are 40 to 50% protein and about seven to 18% fat. And of course, many animals have been documented eating them such as skunks and raccoons and several different bird species. Sounds delicious? Anyone hungry? I also found that you can buy these as snacks to eat from Thailand. They sell uh, perfectly preserved. Uh, I think that they said they recommend them as a, a, a party snack. You can dip them in chili sauce and they don't worry, they've been thoroughly cleaned, boiled and dehydrated to preserve their nutritious content. So nice little crunchy snack. Is anyone interested? No, thanks. I'll take, I'll take that as a no. All right, here we get to what we've actually been up to in the last little bit here in the sand hills. And I have in front of you a map that shows the campground in the upper right over here, those are the campground loops. The observation deck is down here towards the middle center. And uh, we, have, we, have, uh, we have grouped the different treatments that we've done through burning into uh, different colors. Well, let's just say that the green is the area where we haven't really done any prescribed burning. And the yellow is where we began our prescribed burning back in 2005, and that's up here at the top. And then we progressed towards the observation deck and we did a, a lot of work along Ridge Fire Road here. That's this kind of orangey, uh, pale orange color. And then we moved on to another larger treatment block area, 2017 and 2018, that's here. That's off of Pine and Powder Mill. And then tucked in way down below are the last two plots that we've burned, 2019 and then 2023. Each one of those has been, each one of those color blocks, we wanted to put out four different traps in and across that area to try and monitor 
what's happening with the June beetles? Is the, the burning that we're doing having any impact on them? So I want you to note each one of the, the numbers is associated with one of the 24 different traps. You can see that uh, there's about four per color block. And the next slide I'm gonna show you is going to be the number of June beetles that we caught in each one of those traps over the course of a four night trapping period. So I'm now preparing next week will be our, our trap week. It's the last week in June. It's when we try and pick up the peak of activity for June beetles. And here you can see, oops, those numbers. Everywhere it's red is where we found no June beetles. In the four nights that we trapped, not a single one. And then everywhere you can see the small green dots, this one here, this is 12, 11, 5, 4, 24, 23, and 22. We had between one and four, essentially, uh, that appeared in total in the four nights. And the most we had were up here in the areas that we burned in 2008 and 2009, and that was between seven and nine beetles. And some nights that, that was equivalent to 12 in a trap, and then uh, you know, nothing uh, the next three nights, something like that. So, so there you go. We, um, we're, we're poised to go again. We will be trapping four nights, Monday through Thursday next week, I think. We have a, a partnership with, with Jody McGraw, who I'm guessing has spoken to at some point. Um, but we have prioritized the work in our sand hills because it's some of the rarest habitat that we have. And we have focused on doing prescribed fires. And now we're focusing on uh, adding monitoring of Mount Hermon June beetles to that. And that just about wraps it up. So thank you very much for tuning in. We certainly hope that you enjoyed this video and you learned something about the Mount Hermon June beetle.